says, is no document of antiquity has come down variant free without corruption. But the Bible is superior in that it has thousands of manuscripts where we can see where these variants took place. Hi, amazing viewers. Welcome to Christianity over Islam with Shan Shimon. And on today's amazing debate, San Shimon versus Shadir Allah debates the Quran or the Bible, which is the word of God. Let's watch this amazing video. Praise be the God and Father of my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The Quran or the Bible, which is the Word of God. Interestingly, when you read the Quran itself and read the earliest Islamic sources, all the Muslims presumed that the Bible was the uncorrupt, pure Word of God. Anytime Shabir that decides to attack the Bible, he debunks the testimony of the Quran and therefore can no longer be a Muslim. If God is consistent and he has sworn that he will protect the reminder, how can he even assume the Bible has been corrupt? The first verse is chapter 15 verse 9 of the Quran. We have without doubt sent down the message in Arabic, Dhikra, and we will assuredly guard it from corruption. Interestingly, most Muslims feel that this verse is referring to the protection of the Quran. And in its immediate context, it is referring to the Quran. But even more interesting is the fact that the very Quran also calls the Bible the reminder, the message, the Quran. Chapter 16, verse 43. And before thee we sent none but men, to whom we granted inspiration. If ye realize this not, ask those who possess the reminder, the Quran. The message referring to the book in the possession of the Jews and Christians. Chapter 21 verse 7 of the Quran says the same thing. Before thee also the messengers we sent were but men, to whom we granted inspiration. If you know this not, ask of those who possess, present tense, the reminder. Again, chapter 21 verse 48. In the past we granted to Moses and Aaron the criterion, al furqan for judgment and a light and a reminder, dhikra for those who would do right. 21 verse 105, before this we wrote in the Psalms, after the reminder, dhikra, my servants the righteous shall inherit the earth. Final reference to the fact that the scripture before the time of Muhammad was called the reminder is chapter 40 verse 53 to 54. We did aforetime time give Moses the guidance and we gave the book an inheritance to the children of Israel, a guide and a reminder, zikra to men of understanding. Other passages that show that the Bible is the uncorrupt pure word of God. Chapter 2 Verse 113, the Jews say the Christians are not founded upon anything and the Christians say the Jews are not founded upon anything and yet they read the book. Now the question is, what book is the Quran speaking of? It's that same book that the Quran has just testified is the reminder sent down by Allah and he would preserve it. Other references showing that the Bible is the uncorrupt pure word of God. Chapter 3 verse 3 of the Quran. He has revealed to you the book with the truth confirming the scriptures which preceded it. He has already revealed the Torah and the gospel for the guidance of mankind and the distinction of right and wrong. Now Shabir has an Arabic English dictionary. I asked him to look up the word confirm, sadaqa, and tell us what does it mean. This is the definition of the term. It means to give credence, to believe, to accept as true, confirming, accepting as true, belief, confirming, establishing as true. So the function of the Quran wasn't to expose corruption to the text, it was to confirm its authority as truth from God, preserved by God Almighty. There is no such teaching as Bible corruption, that's a Muslim myth in order to avoid the consequences of affirming that the Bible is the Word of God. Because to do so refutes the Quran. Now the question I pose to Shabir is simply this. If God is consistent and He has sworn that He will protect the reminder and this reminder includes previous scripture, how can He even assume the Bible has been corrupt? And if He tells me the Quran says the Bible has been corrupt, I ask them to give me one verse that says the text of scripture has been corrupted. He will not find it. And if he decides to quote chapter 5 verse 48 or so on and so forth, I'm prepared to respond in the rebuttal period. Now, to the issue itself, the Quran or the Bible, which is the Word of God. Muslims claim it is the Quran and Christians claim that it is the Bible. However, Muslims do not claim that the Quran, that the Bible is not the Word of God. Muslims, in fact, will insist that the Bible does contain revelation from God. And for this reason, Muslims are not surprised to find that there are many passages in the Quran and there are many references from the Prophet Muhammad on whom be 
piece that speak very favorably about the Bible. Now often people will say, well look, this speaks so favorably, that means that the Quran affirms and agrees with everything that the Bible says. But one has to see how words are being used, not only in the Quran, but in any other context. A word might have a variety of meanings. When the Quran speaks, for example, about the Torah or the Gospel, Everyone knows that the Torah and the Gospel has changed over time. So when we're referring to the Torah and the Gospel, one has to find out what context is being referred to to find out what exactly is meant by the Torah or the Gospel. Now, I always find it surprising that Christians try to persuade Muslims that the Torah and the Gospel has never been changed. Whereas Christians know themselves that the Torah and the Gospel has been changed. If, for example, you're reading what Sam is accustomed to reading, the New International Version Bible, you will notice in the footnoting of the Bible that it always points out, or often points out, that there's a change here or there. So you will find whole passages sometimes marked off as being a later contribution to the text and not original. I see some very leery eyes here. Look, for example, at Mark chapter 16. Look for verses 9 to 12. You'll see that whole section is marked off as a later addition into the Bible. It's not an original part of Mark's Gospel. Now what happened to the original text of Mark's Gospel? How did it really end? Nobody knows for sure. The interpreter's one-volume commentary on the Bible offers a few suggestions, and among them is the suggestion that what was there was not palatable to the early Christians and somebody deliberately tore it off. And then in its place, other writers wrote some a short ending, some a long ending, and some copied both endings into the one Bible. You'll find that marked up. Don't be surprised if we claim that the Bible has changed over time. In fact, when the Quran uses the term Injil or Torah, one has to see in what context it is referring to the Torah or the Injil. When the Quran approves of the Injil and confirms what is in it, the Quran is speaking about the original text revealed from God. At the same time, the Quran goes to great lengths to correct some of the information which is there in the Injil. This is why the Quran said in Surah 5, verse number 48, which Sam would like to explain a little bit further, that not only is the Quran confirming what came before it, but is also a muhaymin on the previous scriptures, which means a controller, a guardian, a watcher, a supervisor, a master over the previous scriptures, so that the Quran not only confirms what is there, but also corrects and shows where it is wrong. Uh, oftentimes, the Quran does not say, look, I'm telling you that the Torah is wrong, or I'm telling you that the Injil is wrong, because the Quran's purpose would not be met by that kind of negative and hostile approach, and I hope that we won't use that kind of hostile approach in our giving the message of Islam. However, when it comes to a debate like this one, sometimes it becomes necessary to make a few points clear. The Quran gives the correct information without condemning often the previous scriptures. But look at the information. The Bible tells us that Solomon, who is called Suleiman in the Quran, actually worshipped idols towards the end of his life. He did evil in the sight of the Lord. The Quran tells us, on the other hand, in Surah Al-Baqarah, Ma kafara Suleiman wa lakinna shayateenu kafaru. Suleiman, or Solomon, did not disbelieve, but it is the devils that disbelieved. The Quran is again making itself plain. Now Christians should be happy to embrace this statement from the Quran because look, the Bible has writings which you say were written by King Solomon. It, you, you have the Song of Solomon for example. So now if Solomon was a disbeliever and if he worshipped idols, then what kind of moral lesson does that give to us? If we're going to read a book which is written by a man who worshipped idols and the very book is telling us we can't worship idols. So the Quran actually is uh, a book which should be embraced not only by Muslims but also by Christians. In fact, if one starts from Christianity, understanding the Bible already, and then sees the Quran, one has to be totally impressed with the Quran as a message, as a confirmation from the Almighty God. All of the stories that we are familiar with from the Bible have been cleaned up in the Quran. What do I mean by that? If you look, for example, at the story of the, in the Bible concerning Lot, there's a lesson there for humankind. Look what the people did, and look how God punished them. Now that lesson is also there in the Quran. But in the Bible, you have a continuation it says that after Lot was rescued, he went up into the mountain, stayed in a cave with his two daughters, and his daughters instigated each other, and they decided they'll make the father drunk, they go lie with him, and have children from him. So one did it the first night, the other did it the second night. Now, you, you must realize that if we're going to give such a thing to our kids to read, we'll have a lot of explaining to do. But rather than go that route, why not give them the pure word of God? The Quran gives you the story of Lot in its pure and pristine form. I think you will conclude that parts of it is not the Word of God, and that is the Muslim position. Now, look at the story of Noah. A flood came. The Quran tells us the same thing. A flood came to wipe out the disbelieving people. But now, the Quran tells us about Noah, how he preached to the people, how he appealed to them to worship only the one true God, to give up idol worship. There is a lesson and a moral teaching in the Quran that is wholly absent from the Bible.
On the other hand, the Bible tells us in the story of Noah why God decided to send the flood. It tells us in Genesis chapter 1 that God created everything and saw that everything was good. And then God later on found out that people are in error. By the sixth chapter of Genesis, God is fed up with people. It says that it grieved God to his heart. It repented him that he made man. Does God change his mind and become sorry that he made man? Well, what happened there? In Genesis chapter 6 verses 1 to 4, we read that the sons of God looked down on the daughters of men and found them fear and they came in to the daughters of men and as a result of that were born the giants of old the Bible book of Genesis chapter 6 now I'm here to bear witness friends that there is no God but Allah and I bear witness that Allah never had any grandsons this story shows that the sons of God came down and had sons from the daughters of men the giants of old the Quran actually without condemning the Bible is giving you the pure message of God. And all you have to do is to read the Quran and find out. Nobody has been able to explain satisfactorily what exactly is the Trinity. How can God be three and yet one? How can you have three persons, each of whom is completely God, so that's God, and together there's still only one God. The Quran rescues us from that by telling us that there is only one God, thalatha, and do not say three, just say one. Now as we review the Gospels, we realize that over time, the Gospels were written not in the lifetime of Jesus, on whom be peace. Yes, there was only one gospel. Sam is right about that. But over time, there came to be four gospels, which are four attempts to record the life and teachings of the man and prophet Jesus the Christ. And over time, as you look at these gospels, that the story about Jesus was evolving. So that in the last of the four gospels, you have the kinds of claims which Christians are very fond of. For example, that Jesus said, I and the Father are one. That Jesus said, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. That Jesus said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. So whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It is in the fourth gospel that you find this. Now that you're saying amen, think about why it's only in the gospel of John, but not in the other three. If Jesus had said these words, you would expect that right from the very start, Christians would have been saying amen. And every Christian preacher would be preaching the same words. Every gospel writer would be writing the same thing. They're very important words if he said them. But why did Mark not write them, Matthew not write them, Luke not write them, only John wrote them, the last of the four gospels. That is because the story about Jesus was evolving over time. And his image was going around like a snowball. The more you roll it around, the bigger it gets. So that the image of Jesus appears bigger and greater in the last of the four Gospels, the Gospel of John. He was not the Son of God, but a servant and God's Messiah. The Quran brings us back to the original truth. Now what about this idea that Jesus died for our sins? The Bible says that Jesus died as a ransom for many. The Quran corrects that by telling us that in fact everyone is responsible for his own deeds. If you sin, you return repent, you turn back to God, and like the prodigal son, you will be forgiven. Nobody can explain these concepts, the Trinity, the Sonship of Jesus, or the ransom sacrifice of Jesus. Come back to the message which the Quran has given us. First of all, I want to say in the limited time that I have, I want to extend my apologies to any Muslims. If you perceive I'm being offensive, that's not my intention. But in a debate like this, we must wrangle out the points and speak some things that might be difficult for the other parties. With that said, I only have 10 minutes in rebuttal. But I invite you to come to answering-islam.org where all the points that Shabir Ali brought up went on today on the web refuting point by point what he said. Because in 10 minutes, I won't be able to address all. Now he asked me to read Ezekiel 23 verse 20 to 21 if I'm correct. I will read it and then I have a passage in the Quran I will read on behalf of Shabir. And I want to ask him if he'll show this to his daughter. Ezekiel 23 verse 20 to 21. And this is not original with Shabir by the way. Ahmad Didad made this popular. Ezekiel 23 verse 20 to 21. There she lusted after her lavers whose genitals were like those of donkeys and whose emissions was like that of horses. So you longed for the lewdness of your youth when in Egypt your bosom was caressed and your young breast fondled. Now Shabir wants to throw this out for a shock effect. Basically he thinks that Christians who read this passage will be shooken up. If that's the case, then he's going to have to toss out the Quran because according to Allah in paradise, he'll have 70 huris and this is the description. Surely for the God-fearing awaits a place of security, gardens and vineyards and maidens with swelling breasts like of age and a cup overflowing. Would you read this to your daughter? Secondly, he mentions about the Holy Spirit overshadowing Jesus Christ. And then he went into the deity of Christ. The debate is not Jesus, divinity or not. It's the Quran or the Bible. So your red herrings will not work tonight. 
We can address that on another night and I will challenge you to the debate. Is Jesus God and is Muhammad a prophet? Let's debate those points. Let's not throw out red herrings. And the Apostle Paul addresses Shabir when he says, To the pure, all things are pure. But to the corrupt and unbelieving, nothing is pure because their very minds and consciences are corrupt. For someone to read the gospel and come out with perverted thoughts, that's a problem with his mind, not the scripture that's inspired by a holy God. Amen. Now let me go back. On the variants of Mark, if we're going to talk about variants, Brother Shabir, we will have a field day with the Quran and its thousands of variants. In fact, go on the Answering Islam website and you'll find a book called The Perfect Quran or Was It So Made to Appear Unto Them. The author documents from microfiche the thousands of variants that exist between the manuscript of the Quran in Tashkent with the printed Quranic text today. I quoted to him Ibn Umar who said, you do not have all of the Quran intact. The fact of the matter folks is no document of antiquity has come down variant free without corruption. But the Bible is superior in that it has thousands of manuscripts where we can see where these variants took place. But what about the Quran? The few manuscripts you have thousands of variants and instead of burning Bibles, Christians died to preserve them whereas Uthman burned Quranic codices. So it was a God-believing Muslim who burned the word of Allah. Whereas it was God-fearing Christians who were dying for the book of God. Then he quotes to me chapter 5 verse 48, Muhaymin alayh. And I expected Shabir to have read my materials and rebuttals to this. He talks about words having different meanings in different contexts. One of the names of Allah is Muhaymin. Does that mean Allah exposes corruption and preserves intact what remains pure? Muhaymin means different things in different contexts. And in the consensus of Muslim translators today and in the past, they understood the term to mean con confirming and safeguarding the Bible. In fact, I have an appendix and citation from Al-Baidawi. And Baidawi commentating on the verse says that Muhaymanan means that the Quran safeguards, does not expose corruption to the biblical text. He still has not refuted the fact that in the Quran, the Bible is called dhikr, reminder. That which Allah swore to preserve. He hasn't addressed that. Hopefully in your 10 minutes you will. So I can come back and rebut you. Then he mentions the fact that a Canadian comes up to him and converted to Islam. I have a young lady here who asked personally to be mentioned by name, who was a Muslim, who now worships Jesus as her Lord and Savior. And there she goes. What does this prove? This proves absolutely nothing. All it proves is trying to shock the audience into being shaken by your comments, which prove nothing at all. Then he talks about other aspects of the Bible that he would not show to his daughter. Would you show the verse in the Quran where it says that women can be beat by their husbands in Islam? And I have the commentators and the hadith of your prophet where one woman who was beaten and had a green mark came to Muhammad. And instead of saying, let your husband come back and we will rebuke him for that act, he goes, well, Allah has condoned that, so be it. What do you do with that? If you're going to talk about these points, let's debate these points topic by topic, subject by subject. Let's not throw out red herrings. Especially, I only have 10 minutes to rebut everything you've thrown out. He mentioned Jeremiah 8.8. And interestingly, I've already responded to this. Jeremiah is not saying that the scribes corrupted the text. How do we know? Because in the very book of Jeremiah, he appeals to the Torah and commands the Jews to follow it. How could he if he believed it was corrupt? Daniel chapter 9, quoting Jeremiah, proceeds to quote the law of Moses, knowing full well of Jeremiah 8.8, 8, and he never made the connection that Jeremiah 8.8 8 was teaching corruption to the text. That's your interpretation imposed on the text. Thirdly, the Lord Jesus himself, as the Quran testifies, confirmed the Torah in his possession. And it does not mean that he exposed corruption to it and affirmed what remained intact. That's again your interpretation. One that's not consistent with the hadith that I quoted. One that's not consistent with the fact that the Quran tells Muhammad, if you are in doubt, ask those who had the revelation before you in Surah 1094. Now I've heard Badawi's interpretation. It's not speaking of Muhammad, it's speaking of unbelievers to verify that God does speak to men and not just send angels. Irrespective, the very fact that Allah would tell people, go to the people of the book, means that he believed the book was uncorrupt. And if you came to me, I tell you, discard the Quran and believe in the Bible and accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. So do as Surah 1094 tells you, don't correct my scripture, come and I will inform you according to your own revelation. That's what the Quran teaches. So far you have addressed none of the points. Hopefully in your 10 minutes you can do so. And then he talks about God repenting. One of the names of Allah is Tawab. Who is the Tawab? He repents. Does that mean Allah changes his mind? Using your logic, we would agree that Allah also changes his mind because he responds accordingly to the actions of his creatures when they repent or if they persist in sin and he brings judgment upon them. He talks about God being refreshed. 
If you read the scripture in its context, Brother Shabir Ali, you would realize that the Bible uses many human ascriptions to describe the incomprehensible nature of God on our finite level. Much like the Quran talking about God repenting, much like the Quran saying that Allah has eyes and hands and that, so on and so forth. Now we would agree with you that Allah also repents and He has a physical body, much like you're trying to argue against the Bible. Now, Sam starts by reading the verse and then he compares that with the verse from the Quran. But I wonder how many people really think that these two verses are comparable. What he said was there is a verse in the Quran which speaks of women have swelling breasts. And that's comparable with the verse which he read, which said that a certain woman lusted after men who had members the size of that and whose emission was the extent of that like horses and donkeys, and that is similar to saying that a woman has swelling breasts. Moreover, the passage which she reads from the Quran doesn't actually mean that. The verse which he's looking at is from Surah Amr at Sa'alun, which says, Inna lil wa 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 You ask me, would I teach that to my daughter? She has memorized it. All of my kids have memorized it. In fact, I will take you to the school where my kids have attended, and I'll show you that kids this high have memorized it, and they're studying that and they're understanding it. Kawaib actually refers to attractive women, and that is promised to men in paradise. Yes, we're not ashamed to say that the Quran has promised men to have women in paradise, and that helps us to avoid having women here outside of marriage, because we know we're going to have it there. But those who think they're not going to have it there are often having it right here. <laughs> Now I want to ask you, has your daughter memorized the verse which you have read here? And I want to know how many people have memorized the verse which was read here from the Bible. On the other hand, how many people have memorized the verse which was read from the Quran? In the what the kingdom of Fazer. There you go. How many people would teach that to their kids? Yes, we teach that to our kids. In fact, many young kids all over the world have memorized the entire Quran. We recite the Quran without shame. Now the divinity of Jesus, is that a red herring? No. We're looking at the contents and teachings of the scriptures. And if we see that the scripture teaches something which is plainly wrong, we have a right to say that as far as we're dealing with this topic, the scripture is wrong. That wrong part cannot be the word of God. Look, if any man comes and tells me that he has one bucket of water, and another bucket of water, and a third bucket of water, and together the three are just one bucket of water like the first one, I would say this is not right. So if you bring me a book and you show, look, it's in that book, I would say the book is not right. And that is the very point. So if you say Jesus is divine, that means he is God. But if he is God, how is he also man? Christians say that he's completely God and completely man at the same time. I promise you he can't be both. In the book Common Sense Christianity we read that to say that Jesus was completely God and completely man at the same time is as nonsensical as saying I saw a square circle. Such a thing cannot exist. Now his challenge to me is to debate him on the topic, is Jesus God and is Muhammad a prophet? Now would I accept that challenge? Well for me to have a debate folks, I want to have a kind of academic discussion. I don't want a kind of discussion where somebody say, yeah, amen, and somebody say, yeah, Allahu Akbar. I want people to think about the issues. And I want to have a debate where Sam will come here and he will recognize the difference between something like that of horses and something like that of donkeys and between a woman having swelling breasts. It's disappointing to hear the kind of information being passed. He says that the hadith I quoted is weak. No, go to answering-islam.org and go see it for yourself, I challenge you. Secondly, he talks about Revelation 14 and he's quoting a Jehovah Witness argument. It's like me quoting Nation of Islam against him. That doesn't work. Read the context. It's speaking of 144,000 of Israel who were specifically chosen for a task. But if you go back to the first reference, in Revelation 7, after mentioning the 144,000, this is what you conveniently forgot. Revelation 7 verse 9, all the way to 10. After this I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne in front of the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Amen. That's the context. Do not misquote my scripture. And secondly, he talks about Kawab and what it means. I didn't give this interpretation. One of your premier Muslim commentators, Ibn Kathir, said that Kawab means swelling breasts. And then you're trying to say, well, it's a distinction and a different meaning from Ezekiel. You're exactly right. Whereas Ezekiel, it's metaphorical and spiritual, talking about Judah and Samaria's apostasy and idolatry. Here, Allah speaking, literally, you're going to have sex abates in paradise. Something you need to deal with. And then again, he quotes to me a Bible from some scholars, and he thinks this is binding on me, on Jeremiah 8.8. 8. It's the same as if I quote Rashid Khalifa 
his translation of the Quran, a Muslim who says that Surah chapter 9, verse 128 and 129 was added. That's your Muslim. I, that's not me. What we must do is examine the light of these statements in light of their presuppositions. The people that he's quoting most often are anti-supernaturalist. In fact, I've documented in my response to his website that the very criteria they use against the Bible, I've had a field day against the Quran to show it's not the word of God. Go to answering-islam.org and see it for yourself. All the latest rebuttals against Shabir Ali are online. And I challenge him, respond, and we'll respond back. And if you want to debate the deity of Christ, let's debate it, not in 10 minutes, throw out a red herring about why three cannot be one. And you also misinform the audience about what we believe about God. We don't believe in three pales. We believe in one being eternally existent in three persons. Whether you understand it, that's your problem, not ours. It's revelation. We accept it. Because God is a triune being. And let's debate the issue. And let's be honest. And let's be fair. Let's debate is Muhammad a prophet? Which I've challenged you before. And now publicly, let's take the challenge. And let's hold it in an academic setting. With more time in the rebuttals. Not 10 minutes, 5 minutes. So you can throw out your points and end up last. And give the impression that you won the debate. That doesn't work. I invite every one of you. Go back to answering-islam.org and read the context of the passages, read the articles, go do your homework. And I agree with Shabir. Here it's not about winning or losing a debate. It's about stimulating you to go search the truth and you'll see where the truth lies. And I have no doubt you'll worship Jesus as your Lord and Savior when you do that. Let's now, as the debate uh, narrows down to a close, we come to see what are the main threads of argument in this debate. We've seen that Sam started out by saying that the Quran actually approves of the Bible, and therefore Muslims should not criticize the Bible. Muslims should not say that anything is wrong with the Bible. What we have shown instead is, in fact, although the Quran confirms the truth which is there in the Bible, the Quran also clarifies some issues that leaves doubt uh, from the Bible. And the Quran, in fact, corrects some of the misinformation that is there in the Bible. For example, when the Bible talks about Solomon disbelieving, and we realize that Solomon was not a disbeliever, the Quran is correcting that. Whereas, in fact, the Bible goes out of its way to describe uh, sexual content, like Lot and his two daughters, the Quran gives us just the bare truth about Lot, and does not include all of this. Everybody likes a little bit of sex and blood and gore in the story. The Quran does not go into that sort of thing. Now, the Quran then both confirms and corrects the Bible. Today, if somebody wants to find out what really is the Word of God, you will just read the two texts together and see that the moral teaching which is there in the Bible is also there in the Quran. So that the Quran does not lose anything from the truth which is there in the Bible. On the other hand, whereas the Bible has accretions, the word of man that has crept into it over time, the Quran actually leaves that out and gives us just simply the pure word of God. 144,000. Is that my misunderstanding of the text? It is possible that the writer of the Revelation did mean to exalt celibacy and virginity. The likelihood is that he was writing about AD 90 when this tendency was already in the church. If that is so, we will have to lay this passage on one side. Because, tested by the rest of the New Testament, it is not a correct statement of Christian ethic. This author is saying we, gotta, we have to put that passage aside. It's not correct for Christians. A Muslim? No. Daily Study Bible Series. William Barclay, Book of Revelation. Now, you might shake your heads. William Barclay is a man of accomplishment. And I often have Christians tell me, well, William Barclay. And then I tell them what William Barclay says, and they say, no, no, not William Barclay. Will there be sex in paradise? Yes. Now I ask the Christians, what will you do in paradise? Play the harp and sing hymns? <laughs> in fact, when Jesus spoke about the kingdom of God, he spoke about a kingdom which in some ways resemble our present kingdom. And if you think the sons of God in heaven do not have sex, then what were they doing in Genesis chapter 6, mating with the daughters of, of men and producing the giants of old? No. There will be sex in paradise. There will be food in paradise. We'll have this in a different existence. It will not be the same existence here where there is a foul smell and where there are negative effects that come from it. The pleasure will remain, but not the pain. Now what about Kawaib? It doesn't matter if a Muslim said that. It is true that Kawaib refers to women who have come to that age where their breasts have swollen as opposed to young girls who do not have that. It is a word in Arabic depicting this level of age of growth, of puberty, of teenagerhood. And that is what is promised for men in paradise. That is the word. It says that the men will have kawaii. They will have this kind of woman, which means attractive women. What's wrong with saying that men will have attractive women? On the other hand, Ezekiel says that this woman 
had uh, sex with these men whose members were like that. Why do you have to find out what the members were like? Which author was finding out what the members of the men were like and the emissions were like and writing that in the book of God? You tell me that this is the book of God? No, I don't think so, folks. And he said, I produced that for shock effect. But indeed, the Christians are shocked. They don't realize that something like that is there in their Bibles. And they have to now, except for a few who are shouting hallelujah in the front. First of all, let me explain why we have a problem with sex in paradise. Because our Lord Jesus debunks it. In Luke chapter 20, verse 34, all the way down to verse 36, he says, Jesus replied, The people of this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are considered worthy of taking part in that age and in the resurrection from the dead will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They can no longer die, for they are like the angels. That's why we have a problem with that. And if you have 70 huris for the males, what about the women? How many men will they have? Does Islam answer that? Thirdly, when he mentions the fact that in Genesis chapter 6, the sons of God slept with women because they left their natural habitat and assumed human form. Read the context, please. He quotes William Barclay as if William Barclay is a prophet and infallible. That's a fallacy of appeal to authority, Shabir. Give us proof within context for William Barclay's assertion. He has none. So that's a fallacy in argumentation. By the way, Robert Morey gives you his compliments on that. Going back to the subject at hand. The reason why I mentioned answering Islam is not because I don't have the information. It's with me. But when you're going back 5 minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, you cannot compile all the information at the moment. That's why I invited you to go to Answering Islam. And then he attacks Answering Islam because he says they're not a Hadith expert. Well, neither is he a Bible expert, but he has a whole website trying to explain the Bible to Christians. How does that work? Anyway, let me leave you with this thought. My intention was not to come and offend the Muslim minds. I was here to share what I believe to be true. And I use the sources that Shabir Ali believes to be the Word of God to affirm that my book is the uncorrupt, pure Word of God, which he still has not answered, chapter 15, verse 9. He hasn't answered the rest of the passages which speak of an uncorrupt, pure book available in the time of Muhammad, which he appealed to. And forget Ibn Ishaq. When the Jews came to Muhammad, they say, Do you believe in this Torah we have? Certainly. That means you're not following the Sunnah of your Prophet. If not, tell us why not. May the Lord Jesus richly bless you, and I pray that the God who exists, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, will convict your hearts to go back and read the truth, because Christ is risen, the tomb is empty, and He is Lord, and I challenge Shabir, let's debate on that another night. Welcome back. Hope you've learned from this amazing video. Please do it to like, subscribe, hit all the notification button so that each time we drop our amazing videos, you'll be notified. As you can see in this video, San Shimon began to say in this debate that it is well known in the Quran that the Bible is not corrupted and the Bible is not full of any heresy. Even the main scholar in the in the Quran will say that the Bible is well written and well recognized because there is nothing wrong with the Bible. So if the Bible is, is is not recorded wrong in the Quran, so why is it that the, why is it that you scholars do claim to say that the Bible is full of heresies and is corrupted? Because even your Muhammad claimed to say that this Bible is not corrupted. And Sashimon went forward and showed them and said that Jesus is the Son of God. And how would it be that they will believe that a stone will take away their sins in the last day and heal them from each of their iniquities which they have done wrong? And it will be the one that will speak for them in their last days. So Sham showed to them to bring out a point or a proof to say if truly, if the stone will be the one to speak for them in the last day. Anyway, it is written in the Bible that since they say the Bible and the Quran is written the same thing. And, and the Muslim scholar came up and began to say that, okay, if San Shimon is claiming to say this, then he brought another point and said, then it is not well written that Solomon did not work did at the end life of Solomon, Solomon did not worship God, he worshiped other idols. So he claimed to say that it is good for a Christian to read the Quran and it is good for Muslims to read the Bible, which he said that because Solomon read the deity which he was serving, he read, he read the Bibles and the Quran then. So why is it wrong for we Christians to do the same thing, but it is written in the Bible? And he claimed to say that there are so many words that is written in the Bible that is not the word 
of God. And some asked him and told him, So if you say these things are not the word of God, then it's the word of who? Who gave them the inspiration to, to write this thing? Because it's well written in the New Testament that, G, that God, everything that is written in the, in the Bible was inspired by men through the Spirit of God. So everything that is being written, it was God who gave them inspiration to write it in the Bible. So you guys, is it the is it God that gave you guys inspirations to write these things in the Bible or it's just like copy and paste you guys do? And some asked him, so why is that you guys don't believe in the Hadith nowadays that you just believe in the Quran, Quran? And he said that the Hadith is corrupted because there are so many things that is being written in the Hadith that is not written in the Quran. And some said to him, oh, if he said the Hadith is corrupted, so this thing means you are saying your Muhammad is a liar because your Muhammad was the first person who who wrote of the hadith before the scholars came up and wrote it and the hadith is copied so many things that is being written from the bible to the quran and he kept quiet and could not reply san shuman and san shuman went forward and showed him so in your quran it's very written that a young a, a old man can marry a young girl at the age of six five years and he kept quiet and said yes that is the tradition and san shuman told him why is that you have not reviewed this to your own daughter and he kept quiet and said, yes, his daughter has been reciting the Quran since from childhood. And son told him, right, if your child has been reciting this, and why is it that you have not told her the truth about the Quran? And this guy kept quiet and could not defend San Shimon. At the end of this debate, you can find out that the Muslims had no proof to defend their Quran and they could not stand in the presence of San Shimon. He was trying to bring the Trinity as a proof of point, but could not but could not stand with it because he was trying to change the topic on this debate. So thanks for watching this amazing video. Hope to see you in our next debate. In our next debate. And this debate sounds so interesting to you. Please do it to share these videos to your friends and your loved